All right, welcome back, everybody, to Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. And we are sitting here with Senator Don Corum, who is from the Western Slope, but he's joining us a special today to talk about some of the issues, some of the legislation that means the most, um, and also to talk a little bit about his campaign for Congress. So welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be in Pueblo. We have lots of friends in Pueblo, and uh, uh, you know, you say I'm from the Western Slope, but I've always said the R behind my name stands for rural, and uh, you know, uh, Pueblo is uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, uh, lots of friends in Pueblo, as I said. Uh, my wife serves on the Colorado State Fair Board, uh, and um, you know, I've got a couple of State Fair Board bills this year that uh, yes. putting some funding into state fair and uh, the restructure of the Colorado State Fair, which was uh, uh, an interesting situation because um, it, went, it went from uh, congressional districts to agricultural districts. And right. uh, so we just wanted to uh, ensure the viability of the Colorado State Fair by changing basically uh, in statute how the board is set up. And to make clear, does that mean you're sending the state fair to Denver? You know, I have been a, <laughs> I, I, I have been a vocal uh, supporter of Pueblo from the state yep. fair. As an example, uh, uh, this morning you heard uh, the the new senator from Pueblo talking about uh, his first ag committee, and yep. Senator Sonnenberg mentioned moving the state fair to Sterling. And uh, I reminded the good senator that I always call him the senator from Nebraska. I reminded him <laughs> right. that, that yep. he already had a state fair and it was in Grand Island. <laughs> <laughs> no, no that, that's every year, you know, well, every, you know year. every few years it's like, ah, we're going to move the state fair to Denver. It's like, no, we are not. Yeah, and the, the state fair is uh, setting solid and safe in uh, Pueblo. Yeah. And uh, uh, as long as I'm around, of course, I'm only going to be in the General Assembly another uh Few weeks. A few, well, actually, it's till January of right, next year. Right, I'm still right. there, but a uh, session is over on May the 11th, and um, so. But uh, state fair is is vital. It is it is centrally located. It is uh, part of the heart of of agricultural industry, and uh, it's here to stay. Well, and anybody who's really serious about Colorado, or they say they're serious about supporting rural. Or they're serious about supporting ag, of which, of course, is the second biggest industry in Colorado, um, wants to support the uh, Colorado State Fair. But every time it comes up, and it does mm-hmm. routinely, and we sent a letter of support up on something else, on some funding and um, all of that. But, boy, you see what Pueblo is about when you threaten the State Fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Senator Corum, you've always been an advocate for that. I was just kind of poking fun for a minute, but yeah. I, you've I, been strong on that. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we're glad that your wife is sits on that, um, that board and, um, so that we make sure to, to keep the fair, make it better all the time. We, we deserve, we deserve at least that down here. Um, so let's talk about the legislative session, some bills first, and then we're going to talk about, um, your campaign and we'll talk about a few other, um, so if anybody knows you, we know that stories are going to come up, and that's my favorite thing. What good stories do you have? So um, let's talk first about uh, Senate Bill 83. Um, this, was a, this was a sort of one of the few no-brainer um, bills that were in the Senate this year, um, and talk a little bit about that. And it, this is something that we're working on and have been working on forever, but um, talk a little bit about broadband and the Senate Bill 83. Well, thank you. And and uh, broadband has been uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, as you know, since when I came into the General Assembly 11 years ago, I started talking broadband issues. And yeah. uh, I, I've said that uh, broadband is the only tool in the toolbox that can level the playing field for all of Colorado. Yes. Um, if you've got broadband... Um, you can you can move your business anywhere you want in Colorado. You can you can sell to the world from anywhere in Colorado if you've got good internet connection. And um, we've been in situations where uh, we need to bring you know broadband to rural Colorado. Um, some some areas of Colorado, especially the southern along the southern border, yeah. uh, you know they don't even have adequate dial up. I know. And, and it's a huge issue down there. People don't realize it. Yeah, and so it's uh, it's something that uh, you know whether you're talking you're talking telehealth, you're talking uh, marketing, you're talking communications, you're talking education. Uh, broadband is necessary 
to connect you to the rest of the world. It and, is. It, and so uh, what this bill does is uh, uh, it gives access to the uh, CDOT right away for for uh, broadband. CDOT actually has a lot of, uh, of Internet uh, fibers that slayed. That are fibers that are dark. Yeah. And, you know, we've been denied access to that. So what this bill opens it up and uh, ensures that uh, all of Colorado will have access to that and uh, very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So talk a little bit, and we we talked a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, but uh, I want the listeners to hear this one is really um, a touch point for you in that school safety. So Senate Bill 85. Uh, thank you. That's that's a bill that I actually I'm in the third year of working on uh, school safety. Um, always always important to me. I, I remember a few years ago I was running a school safety bill uh, in committee the very moment the shooting was going on in Parkland, Florida. So I partnered with a thirty some year old um, nonprofit out of San Diego called Child Safety Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got a great organization. They've got a history of of working. Uh, with children uh, trainings, they've got a, a school bus safety manual that's uh, uh, huge. Uh, driver safety training is important, uh, and over the years, they've spent over ten million dollars on on uh, safety for children. Oh, good! And um, basically using corporate America, but uh, this is an opportunity to to bring uh, forward um, safety as an example in my school uh, district, Montrose. A few years ago, uh, they had been to a wrestling tournament in Vernal, Utah. Mm-hmm. Coming back after the tournament, you know, on Saturday night, it's midnight, um, and they're in, involved in an accident in a remote area where there's no no cell there's service, no cell service, no radio there. communications, and you know, not uh, that far out of Rangeley, right? Yep, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, yep, yep. So uh, you you know you know what I'm talking about. So it's it's important that uh, that we bring this communications. Um, it also gives safety features on the bus, uh, and we have the bus in communications at all time. It also has an app that the parents can involve, get signed up with that uh, you would know when your child got on, th- on the bus and where they got off mm. or if the bus is running late. So oh, wow. uh, I think it's, it's a huge safety program, but uh, the training program is, is vital to bus safety. Um, and uh, I ran the bill a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was in state affairs. It came out of state affairs, but the funding was stripped out. Mm. And and my comment was, uh, how much longer do we have to wait? Do we have to wait for a tragedy before right. we take this as a priority? So tell the story about um, that you just told a, that just happened a couple of days ago. How would this bill? How is what you're working on help that situation? So first, tell the story. I, I can I will get emotional about it. You're going to have to do it. Okay, thank you. A uh, 11 year old girl is probably the, the bus is leaving without her, as I understand, and she's she's chasing the bus, and she tripped and fell under the bus and was was killed. Oh, um, wow. How would this bill help? One, uh, child safety has a great program for actually educating parents on the dangers. Uh, whether it be ch- catching the school bus, uh, uh, talking to strangers, um, understanding when they're being groomed for Ill- illicit oh, purposes. Yes. I mean, oh. it's it's got that's, all kinds. No, that's so important, but go ahead. It, it's got all kinds of great features in it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we. Uh, um, I, I was a little irritated, I must admit, because it's $5.5 million to set up the program and put this communication system's on the 5,000 buses. Um, and it's $13.5 million total over three years. It's a grant program for the school districts, especially those school districts that maybe can't afford it. Right. But then corporate America picks up the tab and it runs forever on its own. Oh. Hmm. So and it's, so it's five, it's $5 million seed money. Correct. $5.5 million. Um, and my comment is, uh, you know, the... the, the the life of one child is worth more than this. Yes. Yeah. And and uh, it goes far beyond uh, because it teaches. Uh, it gets com- it gives communications in the classroom as an example of the situation we were talking about in Parkland, Florida. Um, it trains them for the, ex- it, the they have the communications 
um, they can deal directly with the with the police officers rather than going through nine one one operator and and say this is what's happening in our, our, our classroom we're safe right and all that it's just a no brainer you talked about no brainers this is totally a no brainer well and how important this is we you know when we watched um, when in Highlands Ranch a couple of years ago um, and when you did a compare and contrast with um, Columbine. That communication piece, especially directly with law enforcement, made all the difference. It went from, um, you know, any any shooting at all is a tragedy, but when we're talking about the difference that it makes to have that communications piece, um, we we had one fatality compared to, comparatively, and there were a lot of kids that were shot, but it was because the response time, because of the communication, was so much faster. And right. and. Anytime you get into an emergency situation, whether it's a fire, a shooting, anything, the number one factor in successfully mitigating the situation is always communication. Well, and that's true, and I think that's really important in rural Colorado because you've got uh, so many locations. I know I think it was down around Walsenburg last year there was a, an accident and uh, communications, and mm-hmm. it, was, it was 35 or 40 minutes before emergency people got there. Yeah, that's no, that's not I, that's, acceptable. It's not okay. You know, you had a situation just recently uh, up in Fountain, where a bus school bus was involved in an accident, and uh, you got to. But you know, we always wait for the for the tragedy before we make a difference. And I'm going to back to my original nine eleven, nine eleven of nineteen seventy one. Doesn't mean okay. anything to you, does it? No, <laughs> I wasn't here yet. You weren't here yet. Yeah, nine eleven of nineteen seventy one. The Gunnison High School football team is traveling for their first game against Salida. Mm. And I think a lot of probably had to do with driver training, uh, lack of experience, whatever reason. Um, but the bus uh, stopped a Monarch Pass heading eastbound, going a little fast, decided to gear down, and couldn't get it back in gear. They, oh, my God. They careened down the mountain for two and a half miles, rolled there by the, I think it was, if I remember, I was right there where the hotel is on there. They rolled on that curve, mm. ejected 48 students, oh killed eight, gosh. and a coach. Ugh. Um, so, you know, the bus companies come out with what we call the Gunnison package now, reinforced sidewalls and roof and all that. Um, recently, they had a situation where uh, a school bus was hit by a gravel truck. It rolled. Uh, two minor injuries. Yeah, but going back to to this, uh, one of my heroes is a guy named Dan Sperry. He's actually grew up in Colorado Springs. He's now a police officer in in um, in Idaho. But as a police officer, he was investigating. Uh, he was called to investigate an accident where a person ran the stop arm violation mm. and hit a child. Oh my goodness! And um, he arrived, did CPR on the child. The child died at the scene. And it was his child. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. So Dan has been one of the real heroes in my world yeah. of working on this. And so uh, uh, this is one of those things I'm not going to give up. We're going to do it. No, do it. Where is it at right now? It's setting in appropriations, waiting on appropriations. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, setting on appropriations with no funding. So I thought uh, Danae Esker did a really good job, and I tried to explain this um, to a legislative group I was talking to yesterday, um, that some of these things um, we have to wait for. So there's there's a process about waiting for the um, budget and then waiting for the long bill um, and see where appropriations, it all falls out. And so those are the biggest discussions happening at their capital right now is how and where and when to spend the money, right? Right, right. and and for those who don't know, the the – the Joint Budget Committee goes through the budget and, and does all that. But they take what is presented in the governor's budget. Correct. Mm-hmm. And it, this item is not a member of the governor's, governor's package. Governor's, right. So it's, but it's waiting. Um, actually, Allie Kimball from the governor's office has been mm, outstanding. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're working on a couple of bills that, uh, that are waiting there, dealing with student safety and transportation also. So uh, we feel confident that uh, – that uh, we are going to be successful in this bill. But um, it's it's a bill that uh, the general public needs to know is out there. And uh, yet, to me, it's one of the most important things because if you can't put your child on the bus, or even if your child's walking to school, right? It's, you know, 
this is protected. You know, we have children walking to school each and every day, and sometimes they're abducted. And with this technology, um, the response time of recovering them back will be greatly enhanced. So you yeah. know whether or not your kid got on the bus. That's a huge yeah. thing. I mean, you, yeah. I, I think we talked about that. There's there's actually a, a company that, um, from here in Colorado, and what they're working on are, they're like RFID tags, but they're not called RFID. I forget what they are. It's They're, they're active. Mm-hmm. And they'll take them and they can, um, you could, Put them in your clothes or in your kid's jacket. You put this yes. little tag. Yeah. And then what happens is anytime that they're around an active, basically, Bluetooth connection, it can detect that. Mm-hmm. And, and that was going to be their stop. That is, is, is some of the technology that we're using. Um, uh, we worked uh, with Homeland Security on mm-hmm. this piece of legislation also. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, we've worked, I've talked to a group out of California that they do the safety for the Beverly Hills School District. Oh, yeah. uh, and basically it started out as uh, a group of pe- people from Israeli special forces. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. we, um, we're, we're confident that we're on the right track. Yeah. So the technology exists. Yeah. Uh, it's just access to it. Hey, you buy something from Walmart, they usually have that in the package and they can track their, their items going in and out, what's yeah. stolen and stuff. You know, why not put that on our kids where we can make sure they're where they need to be and when they're not where they're at. Right. And that's uh, that's one of the, the things that uh, we're doing with this funding. Good. 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 All right. So let's talk about one that we've kind of, if it wasn't what it was, it would be laughable. It's being um, tongue-in-cheek called the lawnmower bill. It's 138. Um, it's Chris Hansen's bill. Um, and somebody else, I can't remember who else is on, who the other sponsor is for this bill. Um, but it's, uh, he called, he calls it filling in the gaps, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in this bill. So, um, let's talk a little bit about this one because it is in the Senate right now. Um, and they're, and they're fighting it out. Um, it's so the reason it's called the lawnmower bill is because it would um, make it illegal to buy uh, a lawnmower or any of the tools we use in rural Colorado that are, um, I think it's 25 horsepower now, but we're talking um, weed whackers, lawnmowers, um, uh, chainsaws. I, it sounds great to me because I hate yard work, and if I can't <laughs> buy it, then I'm, I'm totally for it. So I support this bill. No. This is the water savings bill. Yeah, yeah. Oh my you can't gosh. have a yard. Yeah. you can't have a yard. <laughs> there you go. Well, and and so, but for for those of us who operate in in the rural community, we're like we're all scratching our head because really, um, when we're talking about having to do fire mitigation yeah. and noxious weeds and all of these things that we just do to survive. And by the way, it's you know I'm going to say it again. You guys both know this and. Our listeners probably know this as well. 85% geographically of the state of Colorado is is considered rural or frontier, which is like nobody lives there. Um, so kind of, this kind of thing, it kind of, in principle, it makes us a little bit crazy. But in a, addition to this, um, this bill also would require um, insurance companies mm-hmm. to do an environmental impact report on anything, you know, pay for and do an environmental impact report on anything that um, was paid out. And then PARA to do an envir- environmental impact report on um, their portfolio. It's kind of one of these, like, what what the hell bills? Well, I think it's one of those bills because there is a, there is a very – and let me – Preface that Chris Hansen is one of my best friends. He's, oh, he's brilliant. Good. I love the guy. He's yeah. great. Will you but ask him what the hell? What the hell? I'll ask him what the hell. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's those that want to totally eliminate fossil fuels. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that's, that's there. And um, if we haven't learned anything in the last week, with the situation with the Ukraine, mm-hmm. um, we uh, fossil fuels is not going to go away, um, and all we're going to do is make it extremely expensive. Um, our, our whole economy is is carbon based. Yes, and to say that we're going to be out of this in ten years is a pipe dream. 
Yeah. It is not going to happen. Um, uh, first of all, our economy can't function without carbon. Right. Uh, but it's it's a dream that, you know, I mean, uh, we're going to go to total electric cars. Uh, I'm, I'm 300 miles from the Denver. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. don't have an electric car that I can make the trip on without stopping to recharge. Uh, am I into clean, green energy? Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a natural resource background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh the price changes as an example, uh, just because of, uh, of the situation in Ukraine. Um, I'm kind of involved in the, in the uranium industry. Um, uh, that pro- that product, the price went up eight dollars in one wow. day. Wow! Um, and our reserves that uh, you know are we're nuclear powered, right? Percent um, is is dependent on a base. Solar and wind are fine, but you got to have the base to back them up, right? And so we're moving like that's not true. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I want to, I want to sort of, um, and I'd love to have, um, I'd love to have Senator Hansen on the show and ask him this, but, um, it, it makes me wonder what's the ROI on some of these measures. Um, if we want to have an environmental impact study, you know, it's an interesting idea, right? Let's see what it's actually doing, but let's do that for legislation as well. What is the impact? What's the actual impact of this, um, for the environment, and then what's the actual impact on Coloradans um, with legislation? That's you just you just detailed what the impact would be um, if your bill passed for the, your safe school bill. Like that's what this is yeah. what it was going to do. This is the difference it would make if we did that with all legislation. And a lot of these, um, it, I think it would be interesting if if uh, legislation had that. You know, we talk about a fiscal note, but what if we talk about the actual impact? Study with legislation. Just to take it a step further, I think it could, you should really look at this from a rural perspective as the economic impact, right? Oh, Uh, yeah. You know, just looking out the window, there's a huge economic impact that is affected by um, energy policy right now that Pueblo has been dealing with. But even sitting in some of the hearings and watching the testimony, you know, everything's about uh, justice. And, And again, I agree with that. But what what is the economic impact and economic justice for some of these communities that may not be able to afford a rate increase due to certain energy policies? Um, if we go straight to renewable energy, which again I am for exactly. renewable energy, but you know if you're from the Western Slope, you see what happens when right. we move too fast on some of the stuff. Actually, my uh, the reason I got in the natural resource business was renewable energy. Yes, yep. um, because I. Um, I have properties that have a great deal of, of vanadium. And so I was looking back 23 years ago of, wow, uh, there was a thing called a vanadium redox battery that you could that you could um, take the vanadium and, and it, the longer it goes, the better, the stronger the battery gets and all that. Oh, wow. and, and I thought, wow, this is the future. And, and um, uh, University of South Australia developed it. Um, and... Uh, and uh, I thought, wow, this is going to go. And then uh, Mitsubishi bought the rights to the to the thing, and I thought, oh, all right, electric cars, you know. And uh, it had the capabilities of um, running about eight hours of highway speed, um, or it, it would you could recharge it, or you could exchange the fluid, like yeah. you you'd pull oh, in, yeah. you would pull into a, a service station rather buying gasoline. Um, you 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 pump the the used uh, acid out the. the and replace it with recharged. Right. And I thought, oh, this is going to go someplace. Well, it never happened. They, mm-hmm. they dropped the whole plan. But if you want to look at it right now, there's an 800 megawatt battery being built in China right now. It's under construction. I mean, it's that battery is, is larger than a city block. Yeah. Wow. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, and I, I know there's been some interest here in Pueblo the the new uh, re- reactors uh, mm-hmm. like the Bill Gates and uh, yes. Warren Buffett are doing um, yes. you know that uh, one of those little units and they're and they're you know they you can haul it in on a semi truck yeah um, and it'll do four hundred thousand residents yep it's amazing 
So everything that you're describing right now, it's because somebody was brave enough to let the technology develop. I don't understand why we're not removing barriers for technology development instead of putting up barriers. Um, and that's, I think that's what it feels like sometimes. So hydrogen, we talk about hydrogen development. What, what is important to hydrogen development that we, this state is attacking right now? Yeah. It's, it's um, natural gas. That's key, the most effective and efficient way to produce, um, to produce hydrogen, one of the greenest sources ever. Everybody says this is what it's, where it's got to go. Um, t- requires natural gas, but we want to get rid of all the natural gas yeah. Yeah. Um, production. So it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I drove, I drove one of the hydrogen cars last year, Nissan. I brought it oh, to Denver. Yeah. I, I yeah. want one. Right, but they had to haul it from California to Denver because there's nowhere to fuel it yep. along the way. Yeah. yeah. So like, once again, what, it's, it's like my 300 sense? mile plug in. I, yeah. If I don't have the range, I can't do it. And if we can't even get broadband, mm-hmm. yeah. over the over the Great Divide. Yeah, and and you know one of the one of the things in the in the in the governor's budget is 150 million dollars for electric school buses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm I'm okay with that, mm-hmm. but. Is that our real priority? Uh, you know, I was talking to a lady, a lady each, um, maybe a month ago, and there's uh, up at Boulder at uh, I think it's the Renewable Labs or or one of those, but they've they've got an add-on to the uh, internal combustion engine that takes a vast majority out of of the the bad things. Right. And mm-hmm. and so why aren't we investing in things repurposing? Like that? Yeah. Yeah. Rather or than, or if we're really serious bio developing biodiesel or some of these other things that carbon capture I yeah think, I think carbon capture is a big one that um, you know you could have uh, just for instance um, picking one coal you know with carbon capture technology which a lot of the energy companies have been developing you know it, it put it's an output is like ninety nine point nine percent clean and it's like point zero whatever right but uh, and that I think that could be a step to like yes we need to transition to renewable energies and more clean energy, but again we can't do it right now. No, it's just an, economically it's impossible. It's going to hurt the people that can afford it the least, and exactly. the technologies out there. And there should be incentive incentives to invest in this technology, get it better until we can finally go to this renewable energy. Yeah. And and why are, why are we not focusing or putting our focus on that instead of lawnmowers and chainsaws? Yeah. Right. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up car- carbon capture because our our biggest capture of carbon is our, is our national forests. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, it would, and because of mismanagement for 50 to 60 years by the federal government. Yes. Um, our forests are, are, are in horrendous shape. You yeah. Know, if you go Wolf Creek Pass and I know you've been, um, you know, the goal is there to find the green, find the green tree. Yep. Oh, I know. I um, know. Oh and, my gosh. Right? And what, what are those dead trees doing? They're releasing carbon. They yep. are. And yeah, beetle kill is just, it's yep. so bad. It's so bad. Yeah. yeah. Try, find a green tree. Find a green tree. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and, you know, we've got, um, you know, over in the valley, you've got the big sawmill there. We've got, I think, the largest mill in Colorado. Montrose, Montrose yeah. Forest Products. You've been there. Yep. Uh, they just spent another fifty million dollars or so uh, upgrading uh, because they're uh, the the dead trees in the forest are at the end of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they can no longer use them for merchantable lumber. So what are we going to do? Um, you know, uh, we could still use them for for biomass, biochar, but um, trying to get go through the process of creating electricity. Uh, using biochar, once again, you talk about the roadblocks. Yeah, there's more barriers than than anything else on that. But even something simple like, and for our rural communities, so many of us still, us included, still use, um, you know, a wood burning stove. We still do that, and so, um, but you go up there, and you're, you know, what you have to go through to go and get the wood, and mm-hmm. and and you have a whole population that would help out with this, but there's more barriers. Right. You have you have um, startups. Companies that would love to do this, but there's barriers, barrier after barrier after barrier. Even more importantly, one thing you said, you know, mismanagement by the the federal side. 
Forest Service and a lot of these agencies have been calling for this to happen. You know, that they understand it. The people that are managing are understanding it, but their hands are tied when it comes to actually mitigation, cleaning up these forests and everything. Well, I, I would totally agree with it. I think the people on the ground for those agencies totally understand. Yes. Yeah. It, it's oh, that little do. office that's, uh, you know, back <laughs> on the East Coast, that's the, yep. that's the, that's the barrier. And, yeah, and big office on the hill. And yeah. the guy, and these scientists, these people who are out here working it, they need to have some autonomy to make some decisions for sure. But that's part of that's part of the other issue. So, all right. So now let's talk about it. You're running for Congress. I'm yes. going to ask you the question <laughs> right off. Why are you running for Congress? Well, thank you for the question. Um, and the reason I'm running for Congress, and I said this in my opening statement, um, in in today's world. Um, it seems like the extreme left, the extreme right, are getting all the notoriety. They're getting all the interest. Uh, we're at a we're at a gridlock, <laughs> and the eighty percent in the middle, whether we be Republican, Democrat, or unaffiliated, are being ignored. Yep. Yes. And I also sent a message to both major parties at the same time that if you think that uh, uh, loud rhetoric uh, promoting hate and division is the future of your parties, your parties have no future. I predict that by election day, 50% of the electorate are going to be unaffiliated because they are sick and tired sick of, of party politics. <laughs> and I am sick and tired of poly, party politics. I am not. Right there. You and I are the same way about this. Right okay. there, brother. All right. Um, I get crazy about it. I, I don't care whose idea is. I care what the idea is. Yep. And uh, Not who's I've been, right, what's I've been right. totally criticized for working across the aisle. Mm -hmm. But if you go back over the last 11 years that I've been in the General Assembly, there's probably very few legislators that have, that have created and passed more legislation than I have because I've done it as the approach is what is good for Colorado, mm -hmm. not as what is good for the Republican or the Democrat Party. And we appreciate that's that. That's why I am running. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we ask the question a lot. Um, who who are they serving? Mm -hmm. Are they serving party or are they serving Colorado? And it's one yeah. of the things that um, we yell about all the time. So I wanted to ask you that before we get into water because water, um, Colorado water is not Colorado water. Um, it's a federal issue as well as um, a Colorado issue. It's wildly complicated. Um, and you and I... Um, had, we'll call it a discussion, an early Saturday morning discussion um, over Senate Bill 29, which is the um, – it's a water speculation bill. So this whole bill – so for everybody and – and because we wanted to talk this out. And because the, the question that I asked you was why you put your name on the bill and you said because we need to have the conversation, we need which I totally – and that was the primary reason I wanted you to come on the show today, well, well, so that we I, could have this conversation. I hope, I hope we have an hour or so to discuss this. <laughs> this. Um, we have as much water, time as well, we need. Water speculation is um, is illegal in Colorado. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but water speculation is happening. Correct. As an example, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was involved. Uh, there was a situation in the Lost Creek Aquifer where – Governor Owens and his organization was trying to to transfer water out of that to, to the metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. That sounds very familiar right now. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's interesting. So anyway, um, they they would take um, they would go before the groundwater commission. They would be denied, and uh, they would uh, then say, "Well, we have more evidence." So it would go back. Through the water system, through the legal system, so the the, the farmers and ranchers that were tr trying to protect their property would have to lawyer up again, uh, hire another engineer. Right. And uh, I talked to one family in fourteen years, spent nine hundred thousand dollars on water oh attorneys. Oh my gosh! So if you want to break a farm or ranch, you litigate it to you death. You got to litigate it to death. Okay, so let's back up for just a second because here's the thing that I when I didn't understand this and and Brian's been in this longer than I have, but when I started I had no with Action 22, I had no concept of water and water law in Colorado. I mean, I'd skirted it and I kind of knew it was so we need to do a little quick little glossary okay. of terms. So, 
Um, Water law in Colorado, the reason, one of the reasons it's unique and the one of the reasons it's a federal issue. So stop me when I'm wrong, both of you. So um, the re- one of the reasons it's a federal issue is because um, water, Colorado, well, there's only two states in the union that water does not flow into. It only flows out of. The other one is Hawaii. So it's Colorado and, H- and Hawaii. And so because of that, um, there's federal mandates on the water that exists or or comes originally from Colorado. So that's one thing that people don't really get. And I, I didn't get it back in, you know, 10 years ago. I didn't really understand that. I'd heard that, but I didn't understand it. But I remember, was it 91 or 92 when they started pumping water out of the San Luis Valley, um, under federal mandate, um, I, that's when I started at Adam State. So that was all the talk then, but I, I didn't even understand it there. So that's, I mean, that's why it's a federal issue as well as a state issue, right? Well, yeah. And, you know, we go back to, to 1922 in the, the Colorado Compact. Um, you know, the upper basins, the lower basins, and, uh, uh, you know, we in the upper basins are required to send uh, 75 million acre feet of water over 10 year rolling average. So that's average in seven and a half and a million a year. Colorado's obligation is just short of 52% of that. Uh, yeah, Colorado yeah. furnishes the water for 18 states and two yeah. countries. Yep. So, uh, you know, water is, is, is certainly vital. Uh, the lower basins um, uh, have uh, basically, they're entitled to seven and a half million acre feet. Um, they've got an average of about nine. Um, but, you know, They've taken far more than their allocation since 1922. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if if uh, they the lower basins had lived within their what they had agreed to use, uh, there would be no situations. Lake Powell, Lake Mead we, would be full, and the rivers would be flowing. Yeah. Right. So um, so we're in the situation of right now. You know, we've been in what I call the 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 twenty year cycle. Uh, uh, and I call it a cycle because this is not the first time. Right. If, if you go back, you know, eight hundred to thousand years, you can you can track these cycles. So we are in this cycle. Is water rare and 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 uh, short right now? Absolutely. Right. And so we need to understand that we need to do something. We finally got the lower basins doing, but you know. Uh, We've been prohibited from storage. I was going to so say, long. yeah, yeah. So uh, storage is the issue. So, so if you remember, uh, and you guys do, but for our listeners, if you remember, it wasn't um, that long ago that you couldn't even capture the rainwater that was running off your roof. It was illegal to do that, and it's because of those kinds of things, mm-hmm. which people don't understand because mm-hmm. it doesn't make any sense that you can't have a water barrel or anything that you do. So storage isn't, is prohibited unless it was grandfathered in. Correct. Um, and you know, if you go back, uh, to the, the, the real water Buffalo in the, in, uh, the congressional district was Wayne Aspinall mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, going back, but you know, back in the fifties, the federal government started identifying these sites as possible locations. You know, we've got, uh, We've got them throughout the state. Uh, they've been they're in fed, federal legislation, but never funded. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody went to come, come along and said, "Oh no! What we really need to do is drain Lake Powell and Lake Mead, and put it back to natural." And uh, my comment uh, to anybody that I talk to, especially young students in in universities and high schools, um, uh, you you the first thing you should do if you live in Colorado is either read the book Centennial or at least watch the movie mm-hmm. because before we developed agriculture uh, by July, all of our rivers were dry. Yeah. They were done. Yeah. So retiming is important. I, I um, uh, when I, when I got on the interim water committee several years ago, we were meeting in steamboat and I will never forget this statement that T Wright Dickinson was the, Chair, chairman of the Colorado Cattlemen Association. And he said his biggest fear, he has a, gra- a ranch on the green where it comes out of Utah, right. runs into oh, Colorado, yeah. okay. um, and, and the Yampa yeah. uh, drums, um, dumps into the green, and right. that's his ranch. Okay. Um, he said, my biggest fear is when it rains in May in Steamboat. And I thought, 
Why? They don't irrigate. Mm. Oh. So the irrigate, the, the water does not perk in, into the into the the, 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 the soil. Yeah. And the, the retiming of it brings it back, and it keeps a live river. Hmm. So those are the important those things. Those are the important things. That, that um, I don't think we teach. No, we don't teach it. Uh, it. It should be part of Colorado history. A water should be a big, important part. You know, they require it in yeah. schools, and we don't teach water history yeah. here. Okay, so let's talk about what water speculation is, because most people do not know what that means. Well, um, there's water speculation. Um, we talked about that. Uh, you've got a situation down in uh, in uh, San Luis Valley where yes. Cleve talked about uh, the governor's plan, former governor's plan to take 22,000 acre feet of water and sell it to, he's working with Douglas County. So, so what water speculation is you buy up water rights because that is a, it is a, a right here. You, it's like if you own a piece of property, water, uh, water property is a, it, that's a thing. Yeah. So you can own it. So it's owned well, I, by. I, I'm going to disagree with you a little okay, bit there let's because go. you cannot own the water. Okay. You water, water belongs to the people of Colorado. Yeah. You, you have a right to purchase the right to use water yes. for beneficial right. use. Okay. And so, and we're talking, mm-hmm. when you're talking beneficial use, um, uh, let's say you own 10 acre feet of water. Oh, right. But, and, and you're, you're, you've got 10 acre feet, but your right is only for the consumptive use. Of okay, that. perfect. All right. So, so you, it's for the so you really use. may not have 10 acre feet because uh, you use like the you water. Don't, you don't own this. Right. Right. I own this because it's in a bottle. And you, and be, you but, own it because it's in a bottle and because you'll consume it. Right. But, Correct. Uh, the consumption is based on what does the plant need or what does a municipality need right. or, or that. Um, but return flows are huge. Um, in the basin that I live in, it's... Uh, the largest irrigation system on the Western Slope. Um, the first Bureau of Reclamation project, the Gunnison Tunnel, mm-hmm. because as I talked about, the Uncapagua River, which runs through our valley, and you've been there many times, Brian. Yes. Um, it was they, they were going to supply agricultural products to the to the mining communities. Oh, gotcha. But they ran out of water before they could complete could their get crop. To do it. Yeah. So so they started this five point eight mile tunnel. Uh, transferring a thousand cubic feet per second from the Gunnison River uh, to to Colorado. It's got a water right of like 1909. Okay. Um, so it's it's one of the oldest water rights in the region. Uh, so, go ahead. I, I was going to say um, one thing that some of our viewers may not be aware of, but what is an actual acre foot of water? Mm-hmm. Uh, it is enough water to cover one acre forty three thousand five hundred sixty uh, square feet. Um, with one foot of water, one foot deep. Yeah, that's a really, this is a really important, that's again in the glossary mm-hmm. of terms, that's a really important part of it. So water speculation is when you buy the right of use and then you resell it at a profit. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't have pro- a problem with that. Right. First of all, um, water a farmers, that's his 401k. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, we cannot interfere with his right to sell that water to someone else who can put it to a beneficial use. Correct. Um, and so a couple of years ago, maybe uh, probably three years ago, I introduced uh, water let's, uh, water speculation because of situations. Uh, are you aware that water is traded on Wall Street? I, I, was, I was actually going to bring that up. I was not <laughs> yeah, aware. Yeah. Bri- of yeah. course, Brian knows. Yeah. But. So these investment firms... Mm-hmm. Are going out and uh, so they're, they're like hedge funds. They're hedge funds. Yeah, they're buying up water rights and and they own uh, in Mesa County about ten percent of the farmland in the irrigation system in Mesa County. Because that's part of the spo- the speculation mm-hmm. law is that you can't just buy buy and dry is what they call it. You actually have to use it on the land. Or or, or, transfer, to a or transfer it to yeah. a beneficial use. And usually we're talking about ag. We're talking about agricultural development for that beneficial use is what we're usually talking about. But that's where the water is. But yeah. that's ag. where the water is. So let's let's look at Mesa County and you go into the lower lower 
Valley of Mesa County. Um, so you buy up that water right, mm -hmm. and y you can say, well, we're going to take a non-use on this, mm -hmm. and which is I'm okay with. But a non-use, the water stays in the stream, but you can't shepherd it by the next head gate. Mm -hmm. So the guy with, with, with a water right there can say, well, the, you know, hey, there's extra water. So rather than three acre feet, uh, there's four or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to use that water. I'm okay with that. Yeah. What I'm concerned about is when you're in the lower basin and there's, you say we're going to take a non-use, we're going to take it, put it back in the river. But there's no priority user downstream that can benefit from the use of that water being. So what has happened? It has left the state. It's gone. Yeah. Um, and where is it going to end up? Probably California. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my concern. Um, so we we put together um, a committee of, I believe, about 26 people to talk about water speculations. And they couldn't come up with a solution. Right. And I think part of the problem was um, it's so complex. It is. Uh, that they couldn't come up with a solution, so they said, well, do nothing. Yeah. But the problem that I had with the committee, because I presumed when when the legislation came forward, as I did on, on uh, uh, redistricting and other things. Right. You bring it back to the communities for these all these public meetings. Well, they never brought it back to the general public. They brought it back to the oh, little roundtable groups yeah. that are all made up by. Frankly, there's a lot of it's a lot of the water business anymore is the the legal community and the environmental community have a huge hold of that. Sure. So they never brought it back. To the the farmer that says, "Well, I don't have time to do that, you know, yeah. uh, because I'm trying to make a living on the farm." And it's complicated, and so you just t have a tendency. If and if I wasn't it, I'd be the same way. Throw their, your hands up, but then I hear about what's going on with renewable water resources, and I literally we sat Brian and I sat here. I'm like Brian, you're going to have to look into this because. The blood of my ancestors were screaming. I was too emotional when I heard about what was going on again in the San Luis Valley about mm -hmm. coming after the water. So with everything you just said, and I'm just going to let you say it, what's so bad about the about um, what Renewable Water Resources is proposing? Have you ever... I know you have, so I shouldn't even say this, but have you ever taken the little... Out here at Boone, take a left and follow the Arkansas River. Of course. Where what was once very productive farmland, uh, sugar it's beets, just, mm -hmm. uh, agriculture, uh, small communities. Um, you know, it it looks, it's just a barren desert today. Yeah. The communities have died. Yep. So... I, I think that is the situation that I'm concerned about. When you take the water totally off the land, totally out of basin, right? you are destroying the economic life of that community. Oh, uh, and, yeah. And, you know, uh, what is wrong with this to begin with? I, I think uh, uh, the governor's office is, um, and, I, and I don't know where the money's coming from. I mean, I could speculate. Uh, mm -hmm. I do know he just resigned from the board of directors of the Bank of Moscow. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying it's Russian money, but mm -hmm. I think it could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Russians seem to be needing their monies elsewhere anyway right now, so <laughs> that may not be an issue. Yeah. But to take your taxpayer dollars, the ARP funds, that Douglas County says, we're going to give you $20 million and, and for, to start this project. And there's no guarantee. There's, so, but the only yeah. the only guarantee is we have is if we don't deliver, um, you know, we give you the ask, the ask, 
assets of the corporation. What's the assets of the corporation is the ranch that they bought for $6 million. Right. Yeah. So you're trading $20 million for a $6 million, for $6 million ranch million. That, you, that you have no capabilities of managing. So for That's it, my concern. Let me back up because I'm not entirely sure that, I mean, we've been talking about it a lot, but I'm not entirely sure all of our listeners know what's going on with renewable water resources. So renewable water resources, who you um, said have done this before, um, what they're proposing is that they would come in and buy um, a bunch of these water rights. And we want to protect those water use rights. Um, see, I'm gonna, I've added that to the the descriptor, Thank thanks you. to you, the water use rights, because they are largely owned by um, ag producers, farmers. Um, and that is, you know, what they are, it, it, is a, it is of tremendous value to them. But the idea is they're going to do all of, you know, they're going to buy up these water rights. But they propose to Douglas County commissioners, and I'll follow up with how this is going to go, um, a little bit in just a second and said, why don't you use $20 million of your ARP funds to create a pipeline, a physical pipeline. We're going to pump the water out and somehow they, and I can't make the math work for my, for my life. And I'm not a mathematician. So I'll give the benefit of the doubt on, I just don't understand the math, no matter how I look at it, um, that they're going to um, pump 22,000 acres, acre feet, acre yeah. feet a year. So 22,000, that's a full acre, a foot deep. 24 hours a day, 365. Mm-hmm. Yep. They're going to cu- pump out 22,000 acre feet. And then somehow, again, this is the part where the math escapes me, they're going to put w- the water back. In theory, that's what their proposal says. I don't understand how that would work. I don't well, think anybody does. <laughs> I was going to say, if you, if you can explain this to me, me, me this, is, this is already a depleted aquifer. It's already a depleted yeah, aquifer. And, and there's a lot of misinformation that, that's put out there on that it's, uh, you know, this vibrant, full reservoir of water. <laughs> and I'm like, have you not. been down there? I, I know. And, and, yeah. and something else, like, I don't know if the – the Fountain of Youth is in the valley, but this seems to come up every two to three years. There's another project like this that that's just yeah. That this is again, yeah. we have to fight. Oh, yeah, and and you've got another it. one down in southeast Colorado. In your, I know, yeah. you know, in Me too. Uh, in the LGS Holdings. Yep, yeah. You got another situation there where you know they have been gone. This once again investment group has gone right. in and uh, bought up a farm. Bought up, bought up uh, farms. farms. Yep. Um, and uh, they've been granted permits for 61 wells that produce 50 gallons per minute, yep. um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 years, or th- for 365 days. Um, and what is a depleted aquifer already? Yes. You know, the Ogallala in Texas is down 200 feet. Oh. And this is part of that. And we're in the middle of another mega, well, we don't know how long. I say middle. Yeah, yeah we don't know how long. We don't know how long, but we are in a mega drought. Mm-hmm. So if you drive by, and I don't know, every time, I can't even stomach it um, to drive by Blue Mesa or to drive by some of these places where the water is just, it's not there. And for the thought of somebody who are supposed to be devoted to Colorado um, to come in and say, let's do this again for their own gain and not for at the cost of Coloradans yeah. makes me a little bit insane. And and another thing too, on the, the federal side of things, you know, every two years or so, well, first off every year um, when you get elected to Congress, um, thank you. Uh, keeping that funding for the conduit, you know that that's oh, a fight yeah. every year because yeah, the it, Arkansas it, conduit. Yeah, it comes Absolutely. out every year. It's like it's approved with zero dollars, and that's that's yes. a fight that we had to do in multiple offices I worked for. But the other thing that that comes up a lot, speaking of California, you always see a Californian politician try to basically federalize Colorado's water for the yes. benefit of Colorado or California. I'm sorry right. for not the benefit of Colorado. So it's not. It would no longer belong to Coloradans correct or Colorado it would belong to the federal government yeah, Colorado yeah. water would belong to the federal government so 
imagine the the RWR stuff. Now imagine that from a federal level, and it's the same thing. And that that's a fight, and and I think that's why it's so important in Congress that we have to have the the Western members, the rural members of Congress, like fight tooth and nail for this. And they do every year. This comes up, and it's not even a party issue. Um, it's, not. It, it's Democrats, Republicans, Independents, whatever. Because again, you look at California and our water. They, you know, they don't want to see us have it. They want to see us, the whole country, have it. Well, and <sighs> and, and that is, and, and again, this is good intentions. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about, the, this legislation with energy to lawnmowers, you know, it always starts with good intentions, right? The, well, well, yeah. My my mother always said, and my mother's been passed away. 1982. So it's been a while since she said it. You understand that, but she She's always still said, in your ear. "Yeah, the, the road to hell was paved with yep. good intentions." Oh yeah, you yeah. Know? And and that's and it's it's concerning that we have so many people um, in Congress in the in the U.S. Senate that do not have any knowledge or experience on one of the most vital issues important to Colorado. Right. And how could that be? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> how do this? How do these things happen? Yeah, um, I think it go that goes to also, um, and and maybe I don't know. It feels it feels like to me that we're talking about energy and water all the time. That's um, the lifeblood of our country. It's the lifeblood of our country. It's the it's that um, it's being, and I think it's. We've got to start recognizing that you've got to work with other people and not showboat in order to get anything done. And it's something that we strug- I struggle with. We struggle with. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of people um, that um, feel very, very passionately that if you have any kind of voice, you need to be on a team. Um, and I love so much that you say the R stands for rural um, I, I told my husband that he hadn't heard about you. He goes, well, he just got my vote. Um, mm-hmm. because, because he's, because you said that he goes, that's all I needed to hear. Um, but that's the whole thing is how do we move away from, um, the showboating and the, and the grandstanding and the, the rhetoric, that's the nicest thing I can say yeah. about it to it being, um, being able to work across party lines, being valued. How how do we get there? I think. Go ahead. And you already brought this up. I think the average person is getting sick of this. And I think this election is going to be a wake-up call to those that are on the far left and far right. And not only this election, but in two years, the next election, I mm-hmm. think you're going to see more and more of this. I spoke with a, a guy today at the breakfast when I stepped out. You know, he's running for office. He was with one party, said, holy cow, that is completely crazy. And so he switched to the other party Mm -hmm. and he got with the other party and he's like, holy cow, this is (laughs) completely crazy. Completely crazy. And he's like, he told me, he goes, what the hell is wrong with these people? And he's looking at me because he's not a politician. He's never been connected to this. And he's like, can you explain what's going on? And I'm like, you know, part of me was like, well, they're all crazy right now. But but hearing that he's going to run and some of the other people, you know, they're recognizing this now. And I think we're going to see more and more of that, you know, with you running, for instance, that this is, um, th- we're going to see this more. This isn't something unique. I, I don't think it is. Uh, you, you know, and I would agree with that. And if you just looked at the Texas uh, primary last week, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the extremes on neither side did well. Yeah. Yeah. And I was very happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, but yeah. And, and it's, you know, we've been recognized from as a, uh, uh, as uh, somebody who's in the middle, yeah, um, uh, I have uh, I have said uh, jokingly that my uh, my politics and my driving are very similar to the chagrin of my wife and <laughs> sometimes <laughs> my <laughs> Republican <laughs> friends. I I crowd the center line, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, I, I said to politics and driving the the dangerous potholes and both are on on the outer fringe. Yep. And so let's bring it back to the middle. And uh, and uh, there was an article in the Denver Post uh, early on when it was rumored that I might be looking at it. And uh, they they called uh, me the, the the hope of the, the face of a new Congress, that I can bring what I've done to Colorado, working in the middle, yeah. working with both sides, and, and 
doing solution based right. legislation. Yeah, and that that was a uh, you know I worked for Senator Allard a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, as we joke, the Allard Mafia runs deep in Colorado. But yes, it does. But I, I remember you know the biggest complaint I think it was like Time had an article about him and put him as like the second least influential senator. But then if you go through what he actually did, and we. Our office, I didn't coin it, but the office is like, no, we're not a show horse. We're a workhorse. We get yeah. stuff done. And, and and we need that. And you have been that. Like, yeah. your record shows it. Yeah. You know, like I say, if you go back uh, over my legislative career, um, I think the difference between um, uh, myself and the uh, Congressman Bobert is I have actually passed legis- legislation. <laughs> and, and that's that's also very, yeah. that is, that is very important. Um, speaking of anybody that's kind of in that group, like uh, the squad AOC, right? Um, everybody was so angry. I remember the Republicans being so angry, and I'm like, step back a minute and look. She's not passing anything. Like she she has nothing that she may be screaming and yelling. And this goes for you know our side of the aisle as well, yeah. the Republican side. Like they're not passing anything. They don't do anything. Right. You know, and, 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 and I, you know, I go the same thing with Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and yeah. Hawthorne and, and, the, and the squad. You know, uh, it's more like an audition for reality TV than it is right. uh, being a representative. That's a great way to say it. That's a nice way to say it. Because I've said, jo- we've said it other ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've said it other ways. But yeah, I um, understand that. But, yeah. but I, I, this, this, this shouldn't be self promotional. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did a, a an op-ed uh, or a press release the other morning after after the State of the Union. Ugh, yeah. um, and, and frankly, to me, um, it just shows a lack of, of maturity. Um, I call it juvenile, yeah. uh, which I think it is. That, uh, first of all, it's – and I've had Republicans say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, great. Wasn't that great? I said, how would you feel if someone had done that when when Donald Trump was giving his State of the Union? Yeah, it, you would be irate. If it's wrong on one side, it's wrong on the other yeah. side. Well, that, I mean, uh, our friend uh, Nancy Pelosi, you know, she tore up the speech and remember how mad oh, this yeah. side was. And, and, we, and, and we as Republicans had a right to be. Yeah, and that was... It's yeah. disrespectful. It's, it's lack of respect for the institution that you are elected to serve and the people that you have, have voted for. What's the saying? If you don't respect the man, respect the office. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, and remember that you're actually there to represent us. And you represent everybody as a, a an elected official. You that's don't exactly represent the party. Right. You represent your constituents. <laughs> and and it, that's no matter what their party affiliation uh, is, you represent them. I, I, I'm going to go back to my first town hall meeting when I went into the House of Representatives in Colorado. Um I had close friends. Uh, Jim Isgar, Senator Isgar, was a close friend of mine, mm-hmm. a Democrat. I had a congressman, former Congressman Scott McGinnis, mm-hmm. say, "Man, don't go to Terry Wright. Don't go to Terry Wright." Jim said to me, "Don't go to Terry Wright." Yeah. I said, "Why?" He said, uh, "They don't like me because uh, I wear a hat and boots." And I said, "Oh, okay." So where was my first town hall meeting? Tell you right. Tell you right. <laughs> Tell you right. <laughs> That's right. And it was Let's uh, have this it was a great experience because I I remember distinctly there was uh, Art Good Times who actually has become a close friend of mine. And, yeah. You know, and uh, uh, he was there as a Green Party. Um, there was myself, Diana, and Kevin Kell, the uh, San Miguel County Republican chair. The rest were all Democrats. Yeah. And I walked in and I looked around at him and I said, well, I'm brand new to this and I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> I brought my own cold tar. I presume you have the feathers. You're right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was a big laugh. And, you know, I have had, um, this is my 12th year of of working very closely with uh, with San Miguel. Um, and the, the reason is, uh, you know, the county commissioners and I uh, – uh, Hillary Cooper, you know, we used to go round and round because she was the Sheep Mountain Alliance. And right, we were on right, yeah. right, right, right. You know? And we would go round and round, and we would have these great discussions. But we never got disagreeable. We just disagreed. Yeah. It's that simple and that yeah. complicated. Yeah. Why can't we all do that? Yeah. yeah. And politics, right? I mean, the definition of politics is working with 
basically your opponent to get something done. To get something it's, done. Well, I, I contend that I may be the most qualified person in this position for because I have been married to an Irish Italian girl for fifty five years, <laughs> <laughs> and conflict resolution is my strength. It's right, for sure, for sure. All right, last question. Okay, um, go. Okay, so um, and we had uh, we had Jeff Chosner, um on our show, or the last episode. So we'll ask the same thing. Um, and, um, you know, Jeff Chosner is the DA here. And mm-hmm. he's uh, he's like us. His whole career has been about serving the community. It's been in some. So same thing here. So what, uh, um, what can we do? What do we need to do to continue to serve um, and elevate Colorado? Everybody. Coloradans taking care of Coloradans. What mm-hmm. needs to happen? Communications. We can't I, – I, I hate one-party rule. Mm-hmm. Um, I've served in the majority. I've served in the minority. And each time that I was, was in the majority, um, uh, the other side, the other party was in charge of the other chamber. Oh, yeah. And, and so we had a backstop. Right. And, and so uh, – I, I love my first two years in the Senate because I had Sherry John. Sherry John had been a Democrat in, for 14 years, yeah. changed to unaffiliated. And Sherry John and I sat down and said, let's move it to the center. Right. And and we did that. And you did it. And, and I, I've, uh, uh, Senator Holbert was uh, in the Senate at one time. Uh, he was, he's our minority leader now. And it was budget time, and, and he just said, you know, the two chairs coming into the door, if you and Senator John will just sit there and do a thumbs up or thumb down, we can save a lot of time here. <laughs> because on what I felt was absolutely crazy things, yeah, I I voted with the, the other side of the aisle. Right. Because I, I was there to represent rural Colorado. And when the when the D's come up with something that I felt was, and Sherry and I felt it was crazy, you know, we were, it was a, 18, 18 votes the other direction. Right. So follow the center line. Just it's the it. safest place to be. Gotcha. Um, I'm just going to say, um, closing this up, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate it. And, and thank you for supporting Action 22. I know you've been a, an advocate for all three of our organizations through the years. You know, we truly are rural, and this is what we care about. Um, you know, for the show, Action 22 does not support any candidates or endorse them. But we offer the opportunity for anybody running for any office, no matter dog catcher up to president, to come on our show and speak as a member. And we appreciate you coming on the show and speaking with us. And as a member of Action 22. As a member of Action as 22. As a member of Action 22, and I'm, I'm proud to be that. You know, I'm a member of Club 20. And, Absolutely. and uh, you know, here Action 22, Club 20, and, and Progressive 15, uh, you represent the people who feed us. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you feed the people that provide all the natural resources that yep. we require. Yep. So these three organizations are the most important organizations in Colorado. Thank you. And keep up the good work. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. If you're not currently a member of Action 22, it's really easy to join. You can go to our website at action22.org, become a member, um, add your voice and your leadership to an already amazing organization um, as uh, Senator Corum just um, said, um, we have a couple of really important events coming up. Um, so you need to go to our website um, and check those out. We have a, a housing summit. That's one of the big issues that we talk about every day um, that's coming up uh, April 29th. Um, because we've had such tremendous response, um, we've had to expand and, and make it a little bit bigger than we had initially thought. Mm-hmm. So we'll be getting those details out to you um, soon on that. Um, the legislative session is in full swing, um, and we have a whole bunch of things going on, broadband, energy, water, housing, all of that. And so as a member of Action 22, you can be a part of setting um, the example and lending your voice and leadership to that. Um, we have a lot of uh, interesting episodes coming up, and we'll let you know um, about those. Uh, and again, um, we don't endorse um we don't endorse a candidate, but we do support our members, and so we appreciate uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. We'll see you next time. Oh, and if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, email us at, at show at action22.org. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.